Welcome everyone. We're here for another event in the series Business Boot Camps for Writers brought to you by the Authors Guild Foundation with support from the National Endowment for the Arts and Penguin Random House. Uh, today's topic is legal vetting uh, of manuscripts. So this is pre-publication review to mitigate your risks of being sued and other such issues. Um, we have the very astute panelist, Carolyn Sher Levin, joining us today. Uh, Ms. Levin is a partner at Miller, Korzenik, Summers, Raymond, LLP, where her practice focuses on First Amendment, media, publishing, and intellectual property law. Um, she has wide-ranging experience in pre-publication legal review of content and editorial risk management. She's taught media and publishing law at Stony Brook University, Pace University, and currently at Baruch College. Um, and she's admitted to the bars of New York, Connecticut, and DC. Uh, Carolyn, thank you for joining us here today. Um, Carolyn's gonna uh, give us a little presentation and we'll answer your questions. We received a lot of questions in advance, but feel free to use the Q&A box here on Zoom to type in another question if you'd like, and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, there are also closed captions available if that helps. Um, so thank you for, for being here and Carolyn, I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you, Johnny, and hello everybody. Um, thank you to the Authors Guild for inviting me today. Um, our topic, as Johnny said, is the legal pre-publication review process, what it entails, and whether it might be something that you'd like to consider um, as your book goes toward publication. Um, first, it's important to note that not every book requires legal vetting. Much media content is vetted, not just books. Um, news stories are vetted, podcasts are vetted, TV and movie scripts are vetted. Um, the pre-publication review process is something that um, you know, is done routinely for a lot of media content. Um, it is done regularly for nonfiction books because the subjects of nonfiction books are often living individuals, existing companies. Um, it is done routinely for memoirs for the same reason. But even works of fiction or children's books or graphic novels or poetry may benefit from legal review before being published for many reasons that we're gonna go through today. Um, the basic questions to think about are whether your book includes real people or real companies, whether your characters may resemble real people or real companies, whether you're using third party content, and we're gonna go through each of these factors um, during, our, during our session today. So what are the benefits? Oh, Johnny put up the outline of what we're gonna talk about. That's great. Um, what are the benefits of having your book vetted? There's many benefits to going through the legal review process and having your book vetted by an attorney who's trained and experienced in the process. No lawyer can guarantee to you that you're not going to get sued, but this process can help you assess the risks and it can help minimize the likelihood that um, any potential claim that is brought would be successful. Uh, the vetting lawyer who looks at your manuscript will identify topics and situations that may be legally risky and we'll work with you during the process to substantiate different sections, to revise wording in your manuscripts. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about these types of suggestions that a vetting lawyer makes. The good news is that authors are not sued that much, but it does happen. And so this process is all about lessening your risk of being sued and having a strong defense if you are. Um, I often get questions from new authors, how can I afford this process? Isn't this expensive to hire a lawyer? My response is always that it's important to go through your own risk analysis and to weigh the cost of the legal review versus the potential cost of having to defend against a libel or a copyright case later on. Having your book reviewed by a lawyer can also be used as evidence if it claim is brought that you are not negligent in any way. And having the vetting done can also help respond to a lawyer's letter or demand letter about the content of your book if you get one and no lawsuit is filed. 
It can also, and we're gonna talk about this at the end of our session, help you obtain media liability insurance if that's something that you'd like to have in place for your book. Um, many media insurance companies will require a letter from a lawyer saying that your manuscript has gone through the legal vetting process and that a lawyer has given you legal clearance, you know, good to go for publication. So what types of issues does a vetting lawyer look for? There's no one procedure for the pre-publication review process, but there are some general guidelines that are more or less followed by all vetting attorneys, and there's issues that all vetting attorneys will point out to you. The vetting lawyer will look for content that can be potentially problematic. They will look for potential plaintiffs, people who can bring claims against you, both people and companies, both named and unnamed. And they will look for a broad range of claims. They will help you evaluate the likelihood of a claim based on the potential claimant's reputation, resources, and um, whether they're litigious or not. The attorney is going to look for all living individuals, all existing companies in your book, and they're gonna flag those that could potentially have a claim. They may even ask you for a list of all living individuals and existing companies before they begin the vetting process. They're generally not gonna be concerned with individuals who are deceased or companies that aren't in business anymore. So in my experience, the number one concern of authors that I always hear about is, can I be sued for libel? Will I be sued for libel? Do I have a defense? You know, I think it's because we've all read about the multi-million dollar libel suits that have been filed, even the billion dollar libel suits that have recently been fi filed. Um, for instance, the one by Dominion Voting Systems that was filed this year for $1.6 billion against one America News and Fox News and a bunch of other defendants. So authors absolutely want to minimize the risk of those types of extraordinary claims based on their manuscripts. It is very difficult to win those types of libel cases, but they're extremely expensive to defend against. So the best way, the you know, best uh, way is to take reasonable steps to avoid those types of claims whenever possible. So what is libel? Libel is any kind of false statement of fact that can harm the reputation of a living person or an existing organization. Libel is a state law claim, but um, every state has their own rules, but the basic elements of libel are consistent from state to state. So the vetting lawyer who is looking at your book in terms of libel claims will focus on types of statements that can harm somebody's reputation, accusations of criminal conduct, involvement in the criminal justice system, involvement with criminals, statements that attack somebody's honesty or integrity, somebody's confidence, claims of professional misconduct, moral transgressions, even diseases are all things that a betting lawyer is gonna point out to you. Generally, the lawyer will not be concerned with statements of opinion. Opinions are protected and can't form the basis of a libel claim. But the distinction between opinion and fact is sometimes fuzzy. So the lawyer who looks at your manuscript may ask you to make more explicit that a statement is an opinion and not a fact. Generally, uh, the lawyer who looks at your manuscript is not going to be concerned with statements that are clearly conclusions, as long as you have provided all the facts upon which the conclusions are based. And in assessing whether something is an opinion that's protected or a fact that could be libelous, the lawyer is not just going to look at the specific words that you use, but also the context, the interpretation, you may hear recommendations from the lawyer um, to tweak language in your manuscript with phrases such as might be or appeared to be or could well be. 
that might signal presumptions or predictions rather than factual assertions. Um, I've definitely heard from more than one author that they hate the word seen, that uh, they don't want to add the word seen to their manuscript, um, that it will weaken the manuscript. But words like that do help buttress a defense to a potential libel claim. Um, here's an example of the difference between an opinion and a fact. Uh, I worked on a case brought by a local judge. An author called him a jerk. That's easy. That is an easy case to get rid of. That's an easy claim to get rid of. Whether or not someone's a jerk is clearly an opinion. If the author had written that the judge took bribes, that's different. That's a statement of fact that could potentially lead to a libel claim if it can't be substantiated. There's also a concept called libel by implication that you will uh, be asked about when your manuscript goes through vetting. So the lawyer will not just look at the actual words in your manuscript, but will also look at the unstated implications of your book. Does it imply more? Is it um, capable of a broader inference by readers than you have intended or that is supported? by the facts. There are cases in which libel claims have been brought based on implications or omissions rather than actual words. So you want to avoid those types of claims by countering any potentially false implication in with just language that says, but he has not been implicated in criminal activity or by providing context for different potentially problematic implications. To minimize the risk of a libel suit, the vetting lawyer will ask you questions that your editor might also ask you. Can potentially harmful statements be substantiated? Are they overbroad? Are your quotes accurate? What is the quality of your sources? Uh, is your reliance on your sources warranted under these circumstances? Have you checked key facts for accuracy? Uh, there's many ways to reduce the risk of a libel claim just by going through that type of checklist. Second type of legal claim that the vetting lawyer will look at is whether there's any information in your book about a person that might invade their privacy, legal right to privacy claims, information such as medical or health information, drug or alcohol abuse, financial information, um, intimate relationships, other types of sensitive or embarrassing information. The legal right to privacy is a little bit tricky because the laws vary from state to state. It's a little bit different than libel laws. What might be an invasion of privacy in California may not be an invasion of privacy in New York. So the vetting lawyer may inquire about where people that you're writing about live, whether information that you're writing about is publicly available, whether the people have taken steps to keep this information private, whether the information relates to a celebrity or to a person who's not in the public spotlight. They're gonna ask you whether the person has themselves revealed this personal information in social media or on a blog, or whether you're writing about information that they've really tried to keep private. If there is a potential privacy claim concerning your manuscript, the vetting lawyer may ask you or talk to you about potentially masking people's identities, uh, potentially changing names or other identifying characteristics. Uh, there's, you know, there's certain circumstances under which that won't work. If you're writing about you know, your ex-husband, for instance, you only have one ex-husband, changing his name is not going to mask his identity. But um, there are definitely ways to minimize the risk of a privacy claim. Memoir writers often ask, what happens if I'm writing about my own life, but it's implicating private information about others? You know, the answer to that is you absolutely have a First Amendment right to tell your story, to write about your own personal experiences. And a vetting lawyer will help you protect against any kind of privacy claim and minimize the risk of any kind of potential privacy claim 
about other people that are implicated in your own story. There's other types of tort claims that can be brought against a manuscript that are sort of thrown in with libel and privacy claims in lawsuits. One of those is a claim for intentional infliction of emotional distress. The theory behind that claim is that what you're writing is so outrageous that there should be a remedy for the person being harmed by it. The person making that claim would have to show that what you engaged in was so extreme and outrageous that it caused emotional distress. The good news is that private people have a very slim chance of winning those types of claims. If your book is about a matter of public concern and um, really almost every book is about a matter of public concern. So I'm mentioning that type of claim just so that you're aware that although the First Amendment protects your right to tell your story, there's all sorts of different types of tort claims that can be brought in with libel claims. The other area that the vetting of the manuscript will help you with is intellectual property claims, uh, especially copyright claims. The vetting lawyer will look at third party materials that are included in your book that were created by somebody else and they will advise you whether permissions may be needed from the creators of that content. Lawyers are especially vigilant in looking at photographs, in uh, social media posts, song lyrics, uh, poems that are included in manuscripts. And the vetting lawyer will talk to you about the fair use concept, which is often incorrectly used and um, paraphrasing and other ways to minimize the risk of a copyright claim. Copyright is a delicate subject for authors because authors want to protect their own work from copyright infringers, but they also want to have the right to use the work of others in the proper manner. So unfortunately, there's a lot of myths about copyright infringement and fair use and the circumstances under which materials can be used. Uh, the, the biggest misconception is that something was not registered, so it's not copyrighted. Copyright comes into existence immediately when you create something. So as soon as you put words onto paper or type those words on your computer, you own the copyright in those words. The copyright does not have to be registered. What that means is that just about all content is copyrighted. Uh, there, are, there are exceptions to that. Uh, content that was created before 1925 is in the public domain now. Uh, cop, uh, copyrights that have not been renewed uh, could be in the public domain now. Uh, the absolutely the safest course if you're going to use third party materials in your book is to obtain permission from the copyright owner. Uh, there is some content that may be publicly available under Creative Commons licenses or similar free licenses that you can look into and talk to the vetting attorney about. The fair use content uh, concept is tricky. Fair use is a defense that you would raise to a claim of copyright infringement. There is no set number of words for what is fair use. Fair use is an analysis that is done in a copyright infringement case. And um, there's four factors that would be looked at to determine whether something is fair use or it's not. The vetting lawyer will help you analyze whether what you've used is fair use by looking at how you're using the material, the purpose of your use, the nature of the original work that you're using, the amount that you're using, and the impact on the copyright owner of your use. In a case, a judge would assess all those factors to determine whether, whether what you've used is fair use. Uh, if you are commenting on original material, if your use is incidental, if your use is what's called transformative, 
it may be that you have a very good fair use defense to third party content. But going through the pre-publication vetting process is an important way to ward off claims of copyright infringement um, and to stop those copyright trolls that are out there looking for unlicensed materials. Another area of law that the vetting attorney will look at is breach of contract. The lawyer will ask you whether you've entered into any type of contractual obligations, such as an employment contract, or a confidentiality agreement that may limit your ability to write about what you're writing about in your manuscript. So the lawyer may ask you to review those types of contracts to make sure that there's not gonna be any potential breach of contract claim. Uh, I, let me just spend a minute to talk about prior restraints. I've been asked if somebody can stop your book before it's published, I got a letter, a question from one of our participants about if I send a no surprises letter out, can the person try to stop my book? The answer is that it is not likely that anyone is gonna be able to stop you from publishing your book. Even if what you're going to be publishing is potentially libelous, it is very unlikely that a court will try to stop you from, from writing your book. Prior restraints are generally disfavored under US law, under First Amendment law. The remedy for someone who thinks that they are being liable is to sue you for libel after your book comes out, not to stop you from publishing it in the first place. But again, the vetting process can help strengthen language, tweak language, so that the likelihood of success of any claim is little. Let me just take a moment to talk about peripheral characters. Authors are usually focused or often focused on the main subjects of their books, but vetting lawyers are off, will ask you about tangential characters, peripheral characters that may be mentioned only in passing, who may feel harmed even by implication from your book. So you shouldn't be surprised if a vetting lawyer brings up someone who you mentioned once in a footnote on page 250 of your book. Those characters and those people as well uh, need to be carefully considered. In addition to your manuscript, the vetting lawyer will ask you to look at supplemental materials, such as your photographs and your photo captions and your cover and your forward and your bibliography and your footnotes, uh, press releases, promotional materials, all of those types of materials could lead to potential legal claims that could arise from them. So it is not a bad idea if you are going to go through the process with your manuscript to have all those supplemental materials reviewed as well. So let me give you an example of some of the types of tips that a vetting lawyer might offer to you if they identify potentially risky content. The first thing they're gonna ask you about is vague or imprecise words or overstatements. And they're gonna ask you, can these types of words be tightened? Strong adjectives such as only or all, they're gonna ask you whether those words are precise and they're gonna suggest that you avoid any kind of ambiguity in your language. They're going to speak to you about overstated, um, overstated, exaggerated claims or adjectives. They're going to ask you if you can rigorously verify every statement that could potentially harm somebody's reputation. They may ask you if you can substantiate statements through court records or police records, or even contemporaneous writings, diaries, or emails, or letters, or witnesses that could come forward and substantiate what you've written about. They may suggest if facts can't be substantiated by that type of documentation, changing statements of facts into questions or opinions. We talked about opinions already. They may suggest conducting more interviews or gathering more information. They may suggest changing names and identifying characteristics. For fiction, they may suggest disclaimers uh, or uh, types, types of author's notes that might help you ward off potential claims or altering attributions. 
they may suggest researching the subjects of your book to see if these people have ever sued before or if they have uh, written about comics. Writing about somebody with a propensity to sue uh, often elevates your risk of being sued. For third party content, if the vetting lawyer thinks that there's not a fair use, a good fair use defense, they may advise you about obtaining permissions or minimizing the amount of content that you're using. In terms of feedback, some vetting lawyers want to provide you with oral, oral feedback about their review of the manuscript. Some may provide you with a written outline of the basic legal issues, but the vetting lawyer is going to be concerned that their advice not become discoverable if there is a claim. So that's an overview of what the vetting lawyer does. The vetting lawyer does not censor your content. The vetting lawyer's job is to help you publish your story, but also to minimize the risk that there'll be any claims brought about your story. So they're not gonna tell you, you can't publish this. What they're gonna do is say, these are ways to publish this and also protect yourself. They're not going to copy edit your book and they're not gonna fact check your book. They may ask about key facts, but, but they're not going to function as a copy editor or a fact checker. So one of the questions we got was, when should I start the legal vetting process? Often the vetting occurs at the very end of the project, when you're done with your manuscript, when you're ready for it to be submitted. But there are situations when you may want to consider engaging a pre-publication attorney earlier in your process, before your manuscript is completed, sometimes even before you've even begun your manuscript. There's definitely subjects for which it might be helpful to spend time with an attorney to talk through the reporting, even the writing and the approach. Many types of legal issues can be identified and addressed early in the process, and that can cut down on the work that that has to be done once your manuscript is completed. What do you do if you don't agree with the attorney's recommendations? So what you should do is you should carefully evaluate the attorney's suggestions, think about them, think about why you may not want to incorporate them in your manuscript. And at a minimum, you should discuss them with the vetting lawyer at least to determine what is my risk if I choose not to incorporate these revisions or recommendations or tweaks in my manuscript. So as I said at the beginning, it's almost impossible to prevent all legal threats. People can sue, you can have a hundred lawyers vet a manuscript and someone can still bring a claim. But the vetting process helps you understand the risks that you're gonna face. Obviously some people, are more risk averse than others. So one of the things that authors often wanna consider and talk to me about is, should I purchase media liability insurance for my manuscripts? Media liability insurance is exactly what it sounds like. It's an insurance policy that provides you with coverage for the wide range of risks that you may be exposed to. It can help you defend against a libel case, a copyright infringement case, other types of cases. There's many different companies that do sell these types of insurance policies, and they usually cover your defense if a claim is brought, and even judgments if, if, if they're you know, in the event that there is a judgment in a lawsuit. The Authors Guild offers members an opportunity to get media liability insurance at group rates, and they've just switched to a new insurance policy. So that is something that you can look into. I know there's information on the Authors Guild website about the new insurance company that they, uh, they're just offering to members. Whatever insurance company you do talk to or consider is probably going to require a legal clearance letter that your manuscript has been, gone through the legal vetting process and that an attorney has given it clearance for publication. There are other ways that you can seek insurance, not just through media liability insurance. There may be ways that you can look at your own current homeowner's insurance policy, for example, and, and potentially have 
your manuscripts added to that. There's many different ways to go about obtaining insurance protection for your book. There, it may even be possible to ask your publisher to add you to their insurance policy. But even if you don't uh, want to obtain an insurance policy, going through the vetting process alone is definitely a way to lessen risks. So I wanna have some time to turn to questions. At its best, the legal review of your manuscript provides you with a way to assess your risk and a new way to think about your manuscript to allow you to look at riskier statements, potentially alter them, substantiate them, and strengthen your content. So let's take some time and see what questions uh, you have. I don't think I can hear you, Johnny. Sorry about that. I'm here okay. now. Yes, it was a great it was a great rundown. Thank you so much. We did receive a lot of questions. Um, I'll try to ask the ones that are most generally applicable. Answering very specific questions about a specific manuscript might not be in in the in the cards for today, um, but we'll do our best. Uh, so first of all, how uh, can you give us a ballpark range of how much betting costs, and uh, so is it based on the word count or or what? Um, different betting attorneys have different ways that they work with authors. Some uh, charge an hourly rate. Some are willing to work for a flat fee. It really depends on the scope of the project. Sometimes an author wants to send an outline or a chapter in advance and talk through issue spotting. That's going to obviously be, be a different cost than the full review of a 250 page manuscript. So it's hard to say exactly, but I know that that most of the people that I know are willing to work out different types of fee arrangements. Uh, do larger publishers often pay for it? Or many of the yeah, many of the large publishing companies bet their books in advance. Uh, there's many large publishing companies that bet all nonfiction, but also bet fiction. Some of you know some of the smaller publishing companies go through the legal vetting process. So yes, many of the publishing houses do have their own in-house lawyers or retain outside counsel to go through the vetting process. Yes. Um, can you speak to whether operating as an LLC or other entity offers protection? So there's a lot of reasons why authors want to operate as LLCs, and there's a lot of tax reasons which I can't speak to for setting up a company. In terms of the legal vetting process, setting up an LLC is not really going to help you because if somebody wants to sue you for what you've written about them in your book, they can sue you personally and your LLC. So in terms of minimizing the risk of being sued for libel, for instance, the LLC is not gonna help you. The LLC may help for other reasons, tax reasons, business reasons, but there is nothing, even if you have an LLC, there is nothing to stop a plaintiff from suing you personally along with your LLC. Okay. Um, are there any conditions uh, based on legislation or court decisions when truth is not an absolute defense? Well, that's a good question. Truth is a defense. In a libel case, in the United States, truth is defense. However, the reason that's a great question is there's a difference between knowing something's true and being able to prove that something's true. So truth is an absolute defense, but if you can't prove it's true in court, uh, that's, that's difficult for you. So this is why I said that the vetting lawyer is gonna ask you for statements that could harm somebody's reputation. Uh, So-and-so committed this crime. Do you have a court record? Do you have a police record? Can you prove that he committed the crime? Not that just that, you know, he did it. So, but in general, truth is a defense as long as you can prove it. Mm -hmm. And the elements of libel, I said that uh, libel is a state law claim. The elements of a libel claim have been federalized. So the same elements are standard in every state for a libel claim. They're not gonna be different in Texas and New York and, and California. The same elements have to be proven. 
Okay. Um, on that note, uh, many people asked about uh, different states, um, you know, the effects of the, the person suing living in one state or the events taking place in a certain state. What's, what's most pertinent there? Right. So uh, there's a lot of questions about jurisdiction. If somebody wants to sue you, can they get jurisdiction over you in Kentucky where they live if you live in New York? You know, generally, that's a question that the vetting lawyer will talk to you about and how to minimize your risk in different places where the plaintiff may reside, where your book may take, pl take place, where your book may be sold. Can, you know, authors are often concerned, can I be sued abroad if my book is sold in England? And that's a question that the vetting lawyer is going to look at. In terms of the insurance, if you are interested in the insurance, there, the statute of limitations, the amount of time that a person can sue differs from state to state. So the vetting lawyer may talk to you about if you're in California, the statute of limitations for a, a libel claim is one year. But if the person who you're concerned about is in Florida, the statute of limitations may be two years, and maybe you want to have the insurance in place for that two, uh, that full two-year period. But that's something that's definitely a question that if you go through the legal vetting process, the attorney will speak to you about. Mm -hmm. uh, at what stage of writing the manuscript uh, should someone submit for review? Well, that depends. If you think that your content is really risky, I mean, certain manuscripts, as I said, not every book needs to be reviewed. Certain manuscripts don't have any risky content, and you may feel very comfortable that there's really no types of claims somebody can bring. Other manuscripts use a lot of third-party content, and you may be concerned about copyrights and fair use. So you may want to consult with an attorney ahead of time. I'm planning on using this, this, and this in my manuscript. What's the risk here? I'm going to use the song, the full song lyrics for this song. Do I have to go to the music publisher in advance? And often, if um, an attorney may say you should go get permissions, and that process can be quite lengthy. So it may not be a bad idea to consult with an attorney in advance if you think that that's going to be the advice that you're given, that you're going to have to go through a lengthy permissions process. Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of people are changing names of characters and companies and other entities, um, but they're concerned that uh, the, the identities are easily traceable. Uh, it's a memoir, and so it's easy to find out who the ex-spouse was or where somebody right. worked at a certain time. Um, is, there, is there a better solution besides... Right, right. As I said, you know, if you have one ex-husband and you change his name, he's going to know who he is. But there are definitely ways to minimize the risk that he would have a viable claim. So the vetting lawyer would look at your content, talk to you about what you're writing about him, talk to you about substantiation, talk to you about tweaking wording, framing things as your opinion. And um, there's definitely ways that you can protect yourself from potential claims, even if the person is absolutely identifiable, and there's no way that you can change their name or their characteristics. Okay. And then, uh, then that goes for fiction as well, that, you know, there's, there's definitely claims that can be brought based on a work of fiction or a poem or satire or parody if somebody thinks that they are identifiable in that type of work. So there, and there's definitely ways to minimize the risk that, that, that a living person would have a claim. So, you know, that's something that, that's, that's what this whole process is about, going through and, and helping protect you from those types of claims. Mm -hmm. uh, when the person is no longer living, uh, but say they're, they're famous and there's an estate or, you know, there's some entity that could possibly sue, um, how much of a concern do you find that to be? So, um, Somebody who's deceased, you should not, you know, would generally not be a concern for a libel claim. But certainly after somebody dies, their copyrights still exist. The length of copyright is really, really long. So I've, I've had authors ask me this question, well, the person is dead, so I can use all of her work. The answer is no. Somebody has inherited those copyrights, whether it's 
her heirs, her children, her publisher, but just because somebody is dead does not mean that the copyrights no longer exist. So there absolutely could be potential copyright infringement claims after somebody dies. Okay. Uh, you mentioned an attorney might suggest a uh, wording for a disclaimer. Um, so basically the disclaimer helps, it's just not uh, an airtight. There's definitely certain types of books that I see disclaimers in all the times, books that give medical advice, health advice, financial advice. Authors are often advised with those types of books. While it's not ironclad, it's not a bad idea to say, even though my book is giving all sorts of medical advice, consult with your own doctor. Um, I'm not giving you specific advice for your specific circumstances. So. Absolutely, there's books that would benefit from having disclaimers or from having an author's note or from having similar language um, about giving specific advice to specific people that may listen to you and take your advice based on what you write in the book. Okay. Um, so, um, uh, a lot of people are, are wondering about permissions and they're wondering, uh, they'd like tips on finding out if something is indeed copyrighted. Um, some people find something on Wikimedia Commons and they're not really going to trust that it's fair fair use or in public domain. Um, do you have uh, recommendations for researching so, this? I always advise to err on the side of caution. Everything is copyrighted everything. As soon as you put your pen on the paper, you own those words. As soon as you type an email and press send, you own the copyright of that email, whether or not you've registered it or not. So it, every, I would take the position that everything is copyrighted and then consult with an attorney during the vetting process. Is the amount that I'm using, is the manner I'm using it fair use? Or is this something that is going to need permission from the copyright owner. And generally the author is responsible for getting permissions for third party content. There may be circumstances under which a publisher may have a permissions department and help with that. But in my experience, generally the author stands behind their manuscript before it's published, whether it's self-published or whether you go through a publisher and you, the author would be responsible for getting any necessary permissions in place. And it doesn't really have to be a formal five page permission agreement. It, it can, you know, permissions can often be done by an email or a text in an in informal way. Yes, I give you permission to use this in your book. Mm -hmm. uh, are historical things or, or news items more likely to be fair use because there's been public coverage of it? Facts can't be copyrighted. So factual information is not copyrighted. The arrangement and the description of facts can be copyrighted. So, so yes, it may absolutely be fine. And no, it may require permission. It really depends on what you're using. Okay. Um, our, our nonfiction and memoir writers have a lot of stories that involve criminal conduct. So what they're talking about is by necessity, a, a negative portrayal. Um, do you have any tips uh, for that type of situation? Um, maybe it's it's all alleged at this point, it hasn't gone to trial yet. Well, uh, you don't wanna put alleged you know, 400 places in your manuscript, but if, if someone has been accused of a crime in a police report or in court records, you have privileges that would prevent a, any kind of viable libel suit. So it's best if you're writing about criminal conduct, court proceedings, it's best to actually quote from court records and police records and verify facts whenever you accuse, make sure you're getting the right person and the right name. So uh, vetting lawyers are gonna be concerned to make sure that you are meticulous in your facts when you're accusing someone of criminal conduct. If someone, if you're writing about someone that you're accusing of a crime who hasn't been charged with a crime, it becomes riskier. And then that, you know, that will entail a conversation about what do we do to minimize that risk? Okay. 
Uh, we have a few questions on publishing. If someone's self-published, say a memoir, they don't expect the distribution or readership to be that high. Does that mean there's less risk or is it just a matter of whether the entities find out about it? It doesn't matter how, much, how many people read your book. It only takes one person to read your book and think that they've been defamed. So it really doesn't matter whether you have, you sell 100,000 copies or one copy, as long as your words have been published and communicated to others, it meets the threshold definition for a libel claim. So um, it's a, it, a book that sells 100,000 copies is not more risky than another book. And, and you can just assume that the person you write about is going to hear about it. I just assume if you're writing about someone, you're gonna know about it. Right, right. Uh, does republishing a new edition restart the statute of limitations? It depends. That's a really good question. So the statute of limitations starts on the day that you publish your book. And for instance, in New York, where I am, the statute of limitations for libel goes from one year from the date that you publish your book. If you republish your book with new content, sure, the new content has a new statute of limitations if, if it's updated and, and new content. Yeah. Okay. Uh, many have asked for names of vetting lawyers. Uh, I'll ask the Authors Guild of Attorneys for any referrals we can make. Uh, we'll email everyone who registered for this event. And we can include the Authors there. Guild is a really good resource, and for all sorts, for not just for the vetting process, but for reviewing your contracts, for reviewing agent agreements, for reviewing permission agreements. Mm -hmm. Really good yes. resource. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Our lawyers are quite busy with reviewing contracts and other things. Uh, they don't have time to to vet a, a whole manuscript, but absolutely they can, they can refer. Um, all right, well, I think we're about ready to wrap up. Um, uh, do you have any, uh, I have one kind of fun question ripped from the headlines. There was an article in the New York Times Magazine that involved alleged plagiarism of a Facebook post. Um, have you seen issues with things written on social media being plagiarized and I, I love I love that article and I love alleged plagiarism. So the answer to that is plagiarism claims are different than copyright infringement claims. Copyright infringement is a legal claim. It is a federal, there's a federal copyright law. If somebody sues you for copyright infringement, it would be a federal action in federal court. Plagiarism is an ethical issue that you've taken somebody's ideas without giving them credit. And that's an ethical analysis. Sometimes copyright infringement and plagiarism overlap, but sometimes they're very different. So two different concepts, one legal, one ethical. Interesting. Uh, all right, well, Carolyn Levin, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for sharing your knowledge. This is all very important, um, whether you write fiction or nonfiction. Um, and thanks to everyone for joining us. Feel free to get in touch. You can email us uh, at support at authorsguild.org and me and my coworkers will get back to you soon. Uh, thanks and uh, stay tuned for more webinars coming soon. Thank you so much. Thanks, Carolyn. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.